Thank you very much. Uh, so yeah, this is joint work with uh, my former and recently graduated uh, student, Bini Chen, who unfortunately couldn't make it here to give the talk. Um, so broadly, uh, this work is about designing functions that are moderately hard to compute and in addition to being hard to invert. So these are, of course, useful in particular in the context of hashing passwords, but will also be used, say, for proofs of work uh, in cryptocurrencies. And uh, moderate hardness here means that on the one hand, the function should be sufficiently expensive to compute, for example, to slow down brute force password cracking attacks. But on the other hand, it should not be excessively expensive to slow down the, or to, increase, to, to affect the performance of a system uh, using it, right? And hence the balancing act. So also this moderate hardness should be somewhat egalitarian. So we will wish that uh, dedicated hardware should not give significant benefit in evaluating the function. And note that this property is really not obvious to enforce. For example, legacy password hashing uh, algorithms do not satisfy it. And so in an effort to satisfy this property, um, the notion of memory hard functions was proposed. And the memory hard function, or MHF for short, is a moderately hard function that is subject to a time memory trade-off in its evaluation. And so what I mean by that is that moderately fast evaluation requires large memory, whereas with uh, small memory, the evaluation should be slow, right? And this should imply a high area time cost, for example, in hardware, which in turn implies a high dollar cost for fabrication of the hardware. And so this as, um, and so the, the goal of memory hardness uh, was present in a number of practical designs for password hashing, including Escript and Argon2, the winner of the password hashing competition. And also there was a substantial effort on the theoretical end to validate the memory hardness of this design, which has led to a large number of papers over the last few years. And if your paper is not up here, it's really just because they ran out of space. There are really many papers in this corner. But um, a common denominator of all of these works, which is the starting point of this work, is that they all treat memory hard functions as modes of operation of some underlying uh, monolithical hash function. As you will see, this is not really an accurate model uh, for reality. But before I get there, just to make me a little bit more concrete, let me first introduce the large class of memory hard functions that we will deal with in this work, which is that of data independent uh, memory hard functions, or IMHFs, which include most designs uh, to date. So an, an IMHF is uh, defined by a direct acyclic graph, or DAG, uh, G, which is a certain number of vertices n, one of more sources than sinks, so in this example it's one each. And the evaluation of the function proceeds by assigning labels to vertices. And in particular, this is implicit here and in the rest of the talk, but the source labels are going to be some value depending on, dependent on the actual input to the function. And every other label of a vertex is the output of a so-called labeling function applied to the labels of the predecessors. And Finally, the output of the function is the label of the sink. Now, in all of these analyses I mentioned before, uh, the uh, labeling function is a monolithic hash function, which in security proofs is uh, modeled as a random oracle. And so a meta theorem here will tell you that if the graph has some good combinatorial property, then uh, the function is memory hard in the random oracle model. So here we want to have a closer look at this assumption that the labeling function is a random oracle. And in particular, if you look at concrete instantiations of memory hard function actual designs, what we see is that the labels are usually very large. So we're talking about thousands of bits. And so it's already very hard to use an off the shelf hash function. And plus you might want some more properties that uh, we'll see later. And so what, what, what designers do instead is they come up with ad hoc constructions. I mean, often based on, usually based on some underlying uh, primitive here, it's a, it's a permutation. And these designs are usually not random oracles at all, even if you assume that the underlying uh, primitive behaves ideally. So this is an example of a design which is inspired from what Escrip does, but I could have put here the design of Argon2. Jeremiah is going to talk about in the next talk, and it's a similar story. Right, so we would like to understand what's happening uh, under the hood here. And this was really not done, and it's not clear whether existing analysis apply to actual constructions. So I should mention here that uh, Jeremiah in the next talk is going to talk about some concurrent work that also started looking under the hood and see what happens uh, within actual constructions of uh, labeling functions. Okay, 
So the, the main goal of, of this work was really to initiate the study, and it's really mostly at the theoretical level, as you will see, of the security of constructions of labeling functions and the memory hard functions they're used in and when they are built out of simple primitives. And we are going to look at permutations. We also look at uh, constructions from block ciphers and compression functions. Now, there are really two challenges, two main challenges when, when, when doing this. The first one is dealing with the, the primitives themselves. So even if we model them as ideal, so as random permutation or ideal ciphers, as we do in proofs, the techniques that we have so far are really inherently tied to using monolithic random oracles. So we need new proofs. And also understanding what is a good construction of a labeling function is really a hard task to start with. In particular, we don't have any good notions. You might think, for example, that using the notion of indifferentiability that tells us when a construction is a good random oracle in an ideal model will work, but actually uh, memory harness uh, deals with memory bounded adversaries and the resulting security games are multi-stage games and we know that indifferentiability doesn't apply to them. So we don't really even know uh, where to start. So uh, in further talk, I will specifically focus uh, just on the case of permutations. I think it's the most important one. So these are efficiently computable and efficiently invertible keyless uh, permutations. So this is the case in, as far as I know, in most practical designs. And also permutations are attractive, for example, because you might think to instantiate them uh, from fixed key AES and build a memory hard function out of that. And one attractive feature of that is that your CPU mostly comes with on hardware-based efficient implementation of AES, and this will help you already, already the primitive level, reduce the gap between a software and a hardware implementation. Okay. So, we, so the, the general blueprint here is that we start with, from some DAG, and now we want to build a memory hard function out of it by instantiating the labeling function from some underlying uh, permutation. And technically, we really have to look at two distinct cases here. The first one is what I refer to as the small block case. This is the case where the labels assigned to the vertices have length which is equal to the input output length of the underlying permutation. And then another case, which is what most commonly happen in practice, is that of is the white block case where the labels are actually much larger by a multiplicative factor k. And hence we have to build something which will make multiple calls to the underlying uh, permutation. And we'll start with the, with the simpler um, a small block case. Now, a little bit more concretely, the way we will formalize memory harness in this talk is by looking at the cumulative memory complexity, which was introduced by Avan and Serbinenko, which looks at the memory usage at every point in time during the evaluation of the function and then sums these memory usages up. Okay? And a little bit more formally, we will consider an adversary that will need to evaluate the function on an input M and its execution will proceed in rounds, and at every round, the adversary will make queries to the uh, permutation, which we model as a random permutation, and in particular, we'll make a vector of parallel queries, which might be both forward and backward queries, and then produce a state for the next step. And in the next step, the adversary will get the state and the answers to these queries, and then this over and over until in the final step, when ready, the adversary will output the output of the function on input M. Now, and here the, the cumulative memory complexity of an execution is just the sum of the sizes of the state. Now, a related quantity is that of the cumulative pebbling complexity of a graph. So here we look at a DAG that might define an, an MHF and we consider a combinatorial game where the adversary at any point in time can place a pebble on a vertex if all of the predecessor vertices have a pebble on them, and also in the same step can remove any of the pebbles. And the goal is to place a pebble on the sink of the graph. So we might look, if we look at the strategy, we want to characterize its complexity, and what we're gonna do, we're gonna look at the size of the different pebbling configurations. So for example, we might have a strategy here that places an initial pebble on the source. This can be done at any time, it has no predecessors, and then might continue by placing another pebble. So now we have two pebbles on the graph, then we can place one on three, but remove one on one, we're gonna have two pebbles, and so on. Now we have three pebbles, now we have three pebbles, now we only have two, and finally, we place a pebble on the sink. And if we now sum up these numbers, what we get is the cumulative pebbling complexity of this strategy. 
And now you can naturally have a quantity associated with a DAG, which, is, which will be 14 here. We can have a quantity, which is the pebbling complexity of the graph, which is just the pebbling complexity of the best strategy, the lowest one. And we know by prior works that we can, for example, give graphs or family of graphs with constant degree or even degree two, which have optimal CPC, cumulative pebbling complexity of n squared over log n. So now intuitively, if you look at the case where the labeling function is a random oracle, the pebbling complexity gives you already a measure, is, is correlated directly with the cumulative memory complexity for those strategies that only store exactly labels in memory. However, a general strategy might try to do something clever and compress information on the way, stores excerpts of labels or whatnot. But the uh, result by Alvin and Serbinenko shows that uh, essentially that's the best that it can be done, up to some term that I'm actually hiding here for simplicity. And I mean, with high probability over the choice of a random oracle, the cumulative memory complexity of an adversary is lower bounded by the public complexity of the graph times the length of the labels, which here is the random oracle output length. And so our first result for the small block case will show something analogous for the case of random permutation where we instantiate the small labeling function with a function that simply takes the XOR of two labels, so this is specific for the case of in degree two, and then applies a permutation, which is invertible, and so to eliminate this invertibility, we then XOR the XOR of the labels to the output again. And the proof of this result follows a similar blueprint as prior proofs in this domain using something called an ex post facto pebbling argument. But the, 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 the real uh, challenge, which I'm not going to go into due to time, is actually to deal with inversion queries in the proof. So the adversary can query the permutation both forward and backward, and this is what makes the proof uh, much harder. Now, but let me go back for the second part of the talk to the white block case. So remember now, our labels are gonna have size k times l, where l is the input output length of the permutation. And we want to build um, a more complex labeling function out of the permutation. And the first question you should actually ask is why should we actually even care? Um, so actually, well, one answer is that this is done in practice, but now we actually have a result that shows us a lower bound on the CMC uh, based on the pebbling complexity. So if you want to enforce a certain lower bound here, just choose a sufficiently good graph and large enough to have large public complexity until you meet what, what you want. But, but the key point here, or one key point, that I think also motivated practitioners, but I'm not entirely sure, is that if we use a permutation, our length L, the input output length of the permutation, might actually be small. So say up to, uh, down to 128 bits for AES. And so if we want to achieve a certain large CMC, then we need a large graph. And in many cases, this also implies a large description of this graph. Some of these graphs are picked by choosing random edges, so that will take space. So if we instead we can prove a lower bound that additionally depends on k, and in fact, we can hope to even have something uh, super linear in k, then we might be able to achieve the same lower bound, but with a smaller graph description. So it's really about minimizing the description here. Okay? So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna look at wide block labeling functions that are also built out of DAGs. So in particular, they say that the label size is k times L, and we look at graphs with some in-degree delta. And now we are gonna build our labeling function from a gadget DAG H, which is going to have k times uh, delta uh, sources, and k designated nodes that are exit nodes and will correspond to the outputs. And then we'll actually have constant degree in degree two. And then we will compile this into an actual labeling function by using the small block labeling function we defined before. And the advantage of doing this is if now we look at the memory hard function defined by a base graph G with this white block labeling function, this is equivalent to a function defined by a composed graph uh, the, with the basic graph and the gadget graph for the small block labeling function, which we can study with the theorem we had before. And then the goal, of course, is to find such a gadget graph that will maximize uh, the pebbling complexity. And what this composition here, it's quite natural, but just to be precise, so we uh, say we look at our base graph and it has some in degree, say here three, and what we do is that first we blow up every uh, vertex by k, so every vertex is mapped to k uh, vertices, so here three, and then for every subgraph, which is made by an inner vertex and its predecessors, we are going to map it to an instance of the gadget graph in the composed graph. 
And, uh, and then we do this, of course, all over the graph. And now we get a new graph, which is the composed graph, which now has actually also a constant in degree two. And now we would like to prove something about it and give a concrete instantiation of the gadget graph. So in, in, the, in the paper, we give a family of instantiations for gadget graph that to initiate this study. And this is an example of such a family. So it has delta times k uh, sources at the bottom, k exit nodes at the right hand. And the number of vertices here is quadratic in k. So we will expect now to prove something of this form where we'll overbound the public complexity of the composed graph as uh, by the public complexity of the base graph times something which depends on k and delta, and ideally should be as large as possible, like quadratic in the size of the graph. So unfortunately, we don't quite know how to do it. What we do is we do the second best thing we can do. And we observe that in almost all cases, lower bounds on the public complexity for good graphs are proved via the notion of that robustness. And in particular, we say that a graph is uh, the de 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 robust if whenever you remove up to e vertices from this DAG, the graph still has a long path of length at least d in the rest of the graph. And the de de robustness implies in particular that the graph has pebbling complexity at least d times e. And so what we show is that our composed graph has the property that if the base graph is de de robust, then the composed graph has also some good depth robustness, which is going to give us a lower bound then from the cumulative uh, public complexity. And the idea of the proof here, I mean, I, I won't read all through all of this, uh, but uh, essentially what we want to do is we want to map a set of vertices in the composed graph back to a set of vertices in the base graph, and use, which is not larger than E, and then use the existence of a long path in the rest to build a longer path back in the composed graph. And to do this, what we need to crucially use is the following property of our gadget graph, which is that whenever you now remove from this graph a subset of its vertices, which is not too large, say at most k over 4. This is way larger than k over 4, but I just did it for dramatization purposes here. Um, then what we have is that for every possible source of the graph, there is always going to be an exit node on the right hand side such that there exists a long path of length uh, omega of uh, delta times k squared uh, between the source and the exit node, so something like this, which I have highlighted here. So now, what do we get out of this construction? So it's important now to go slowly through the, through the end result. So what we can hope to get here, if we get a graph with optimal pebbling complexity, say n squared over log n, and say constant in degree, because our final graph we have, will have roughly n times k square vertices, so what we can hope to have is something of the type a CFC, which is at least n squared times k to the fourth over log n times L. What we get here is something slightly worse, namely we get n squared times k to the third over log n. And now a question we may ask is this any, is this any good? Right? And it's not clear what it means here to be good. So this is really a question we haven't asked before. We were just assuming that these random oracles were, giving, were, were costing you one to call them. No extra memory, nothing. Suddenly we look into it, and it's really not clear what we want. Okay? So a first thing we might try, want to do, which has been done in several prior works, uh, is just to consider the, the ratio between the efficiency of the sequential strategy that honest user might use to evaluate the, the efficiency of the sequential strategy that honest users might use to evaluate the function and the, 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 the CMC lower bound. And um, if we do that and we look what is the best existing strategy that you will actually implement, you get a ratio which is generically log n and for some graphs can even be made constant. And this is analog to the best result we had for monolithic random oracles. That's already a good baseline to satisfy, but actually, this is not really a hard to meet uh, goal. You could do it with much simpler constructions. So a better thing we might want to look at is you know, how high the CMC is as a function of the running time of uh, the sequential strategy. So you're given a certain budget of time to hash passwords, and you want to get CMC, which is as high as possible. And, and here what we see is that if we write now the running time as n, the number of vertices, times the time to evaluate the labeling function we just built, which is roughly k square, and then we compare it with our CMC lower bound, then the ratio is uh, roughly is of the order n times square root of uh, t lambda times l. 
And again, ideally, we will hope to achieve n times t lambda times L. But I'm really not sure uh, whether this is feasible with a simple construction. So it's a great open question, but it seems it's at least as hard as, again, looking inside your labeling function and making it, again, a memory hard function plus more. Uh, so this might be, not be exactly what you're looking for. And another interesting question here is that we have this quadratic uh, blow up uh, from k to k square complexity. Uh, maybe we can build something which is linear at all the running times, and what does it even mean? Okay. But it's important here that we are doing something non-trivial. If, for example, you use something like uh, based on merkel damgar to instantiate your labeling function, and then you try to prove something about it, what you would have gotten there was a ratio of n times l that will not depend on the actual time to evaluate your merkel damgar so uh, we are achieving something far from trivial by having this extra term in the ratio, so the ratio goes up. Okay, so as you see, I think in this work we open more questions that we actually solved. So this is really mostly the goal was to prove some basic theorems and to attract the attention to the problem and start giving you some theoretical designs. But I think it's a very important question. It's something that has been overlooked just because it's not easy in prior works on memory hard functions, but there are a lot of uh, problems. I mean, one uh, open problem. So one of them is, of course, that I really consider only CMC. There is a lot of work on considering other metric and other aspect like bandwidth harness, uh, like space, um, sustained space complexity, and, and much more. So we would like to extend it to that. Also, uh, it would be like, one would, I of, of course, like to look at practical design and prove something about them, whether they're secure or not. And we actually don't really have a good sense. Many of them do not fit in the framework I used here in a graph theoretic framework. Also, exactly for that reason, we would like to have some more generic high-level properties of these labeling functions that are sufficient. And also, at the end, we will really want to understand all of these parameter trade-offs and what they really mean. So if I make this labeling function even slower and so on, what, what do I really want and how easy it is to represent these graphs and, and much more. All right, so thank you. So uh, this ends my talk. So we are kind of working on an extended full version of the paper that hopefully is going to appear soon where we want to highlight a bit better these open questions and parameter issues and so on. So I'm ha happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Stefano. If anyone has a question, please come to the microphones at the front. Long walk, <laughs> long path. Just have a quick, easy question. Yeah. So I'm just curious why the cumulative memory complexity is the right measure rather than the maximum, for example? Oh, I see. So yeah, so the, 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 the point is that you want to differentiate between strategies that, for example, require a lot of memory just because there is a peak where you're using memory just at one point and then you don't need it. So where it becomes important is, for example, when you do mass evaluation, right, and you want to evaluate multiple instances, right, then, you know, you could use that free memory for, yeah. Uh, let's thank Stefano again.